Hello everyone, welcome to our informational presentation on addiction. We're going to be talking about the addiction of certain drugs like opioids, alcohol, tobacco, and nicotine. Um, I will be joined by Hunter Hill and Jared Geddes. So let's begin. Our goal for this presentation is to really inform and spread awareness. We did not implement a specific program at our school just yet, but we hope that our listeners will take our biological information and turn it into an excellent program to help struggling students with um, drug addiction. A few ideas that we have for you are to utilize our information in order to inform students at your school um, on the biological dangers of drugs in order to spread awareness to those who think lightly of drug use or to those who are unaware of the dangerous effects of using drugs. We hope that you will learn more about drug use than you already know and improve your school's knowledge um, in order to create a program for addiction. So if you already have a program, hopefully this information will help you to improve it and help students uh, just a little bit more. Um, here is just a brief overview of our presentation, what we're going to talk about and go over. Uh, we're going to introduce ourselves so you feel more comfortable learning information from us. And um, we're going to talk about addiction, neurons, and their components. We're going to speak on the components of drugs and um, all the common ones among teens. We're going to talk about dopamine, um, overdoses, how Narcan can reverse an overdose, and hedonic homeostasis and a few other short topics. So um, let's talk about who we are. We are Lena, Hunter, and Jarrett, as you already know. We are all seniors at Lance Cruz High School North, and we attend an amazing math, science, technology program at the Frederick V. Pankow Center. Um, the program consists of rigorous math and science classes and uh, I'm currently involved in AP Physics and AP Calculus BC. We offer a lot of APs. We offer amazing honors classes for the students. Um, our program, the MST program, has introduced us to this global issue of drug addiction. And during our Science National Honor Society presentation, we had a guest speaker come in and his name was David Clayton. He was an incredible speaker and he spoke about his struggles with drug addiction and he told his life story and how he made it out of drug addiction. He's the regional director, director and outreach coordinator of Families Against Narcotics and his compelling speech inspired us to dive deep into the biology behind addiction and figure out how we really become addicted to things like drugs. So hi, I'm Lena Dorr and as you already know, I'm a senior at Lance Cruz High School North. This year, I just started on the varsity cross country team and I'm planning on doing winter track and field and spring track and field. Um, I'm a diehard vegetarian. I'm very, very passionate about being vegetarian. I have been vegetarian for about six years and I love going to the Wolcott Farm Center because cows are my favorite animal. <laughs> uh, my involvement with this presentation is not only due to the fact that I love science and I love to teach people and help them understand things that they might not already know, but uh, for me, and I'm sure many others, struggling with mental health has been a huge battle in my life. And thankfully I'm doing a lot better now, but I believe that educating others on the topic of mental health is very important and crucial to making the world a happy and more stable place. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me. I put my email down in the bottom left corner. So let's begin with the issue at hand. Um, at my school, I know that there are many students who take part in addictive activities like drinking alcohol, vaping, abusing prescription medication like opioids, uh, smoking weed, um, many different uh, addictive topics. 
According to the CDC, 19.6% of high school students in the United States reported using an e-cigarette in 2020, so a very recent study. Um, this means that one in five high school students currently use e-cigarettes that typically contain nicotine. Actually, 99% of vape or e-cigarette products contain nicotine, whether the student knows it or not. Um, by 10th grade, about two of 10 students reported using a prescription medication without a prescription. So abusing a drug for the use that it is not intended to be used for. Um, children from the age of 12 to 20, so below the drinking age, consume about one tenth of all of the United States alcohol, which is a very staggering fact. 66.6% or two thirds of high school students in the US reported trying alcohol. So before they graduated, they have tried alcohol, which they are very underage. 4.9 million middle and high school students reported using an e-cigarette in the past 30 days when they were surveyed in 2018. Now we're going to talk about things that could make you more inclined to become addicted to a drug. Um, some drugs have different addictive intensities. Some you may be more inclined to become addicted to. If their effects aren't as great, you may want more and more and more. Um, the environment that you're placed into. Some children can't escape their environment, um, but as the picture you see down below in the right corner, some children are born into a family where, you know, uh, drugs may be normalized or shown as like something that isn't very bad. Um, your genetics, your genetics can affect if you become addicted. You can be genetically predisposed to um, become addicted to a certain drug based off of your personality traits or uh, your receptors, your amount of receptors. Stress, you know, peer pressure could cause you to become addicted. If you try it once, you never know. You may try it again and again and become addicted. Um, also, uh, life stress can cause you to make um, irrational decisions. Your life circumstances. Maybe if you are in a family where you don't get as much support, you may turn to things like drugs. Um, having a genetic predisposition. So our genes influence the numbers of receptors in our brains, you know, how many receptors they code for, um, and how quickly you metabolize drugs. Maybe if you metabolize a drug more quickly, you will feel the effects more, um, and you will become addicted. Uh, genes determine traits like your personality. So some people have a more addictive nature to them or addictive, an addictive personality. There is a ton of science behind the drug abuse and addiction cycle. So in order to understand how a drug really affects us, we need to understand what a neuron is. A neuron is a part of your brain. So there's a bunch of neurons in your brain and there's many different parts to them and we must understand the parts in order to understand their function. Their structure determines their function. So there are dendrites, as you can see on the left side of the screen, all the way to the left, the dendrites are what receive a signal. And those dendrites will pass along that signal to the axon and the axon passes along the signal all the way to the axon terminal. So the, the signal will travel from the left to the right, just like how we read. Um, on the right side of the screen, there's a presynaptic neuron a and a postsynaptic neuron. There are two different neurons. There is a synapse, which is that gap between the two neurons. There are vesicles in there, which are basically like little cars and there's neurotransmitters. So I know I just threw a lot of words at you guys. So here are some important short definitions. So the axon is that long shaft right over here, as you can see uh, with the white myelin sheath around it. The axon is where the action potential will travel, which I'll get into the action potential in a moment. Um, the axon terminals are at the end of the axon. That is the last place for um, the signal and it provides surface area for connections to the other neurons. Um, the cell body is just the body of the neuron. Um, the dendrites receive incoming information 
Myelin sheath, which is surrounding the axon, helps to insulate and speed up the action potential. And the Schwann cells are what produce myelin sheath. So myelin sheaths are very important. Um, a presynaptic neuron is what sends the information and a postsynaptic neuron is what receives the information. The synapse is the gap between two neurons and the neurotransmitters get released so that they can bind to the postsynaptic neuron receptors. A neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger which delivers a signal and the synaptic vesicle is like a little car and it carries the neurotransmitters to the synapse. All right, I know that was a ton of words, so we're going to break it down even more. So the first stage of receiving a signal for a neuron will be called reception. It all begins when a neuron receives a chemical signal from the binding of a drug to its dendrites. So there's receptors on these little dendrites down here, and the chemical signal will eventually turn into an electrical one during an action potential. So as you can see on that arrow, the direction the message will travel is from left to right all the way to the axon terminals. Think of it like an airplane. When you land, uh, you go to your terminal, and that's where you get off. So at equilibrium, the axon is very happy. That's its happy state. Um, a sodium potassium pump maintains the resting state of a neuron with a specific three to two ratio that is coming outside and coming inside of the axon. See on the left bottom corner, there is more sodium outside of the axon and there's more potassium inside the axon. And that is how the axon likes it. Um, in the right corner, you can see how the pump works. It pumps out three sodium per every two potassium. And you can see inside of the cell, outside of the cell. Um, it's a very great diagram. The next step is called transduction. So that is the process of getting that signal all the way to those axon terminals. As you can see by the arrow with number one, the first step is depolarization. So all of that sodium outside of that axon is going to enter, it wants to come in. So an ion channel will open and let them come in. And once it gets super, super positive, since those are positively charged ions, it will be like, whoa, it's too positive. We need some potassium to leave. So some potassium will leave and that is called repolarization. So the chemical signal is acquired by the dendrites, goes all the way to that axon and an action potential must be reached in order to create that electrical signal. So the signal will reach, will reach the axon of the neuron and a chemically gated ion channel will open to allow sodium ions to flow in. Positively charged sodium ions will continue to flow in until the neuron becomes very positive and like I said, the potassium ions will now flow out to create it more negative. So on the left side of the screen, we have an example of the whole overview of what goes on during an action potential. So this is really what an action potential is. It starts out at equilibrium with three sodium for every two potassium, and it's at negative 70 millivolts. So we re receive a stimulus like a drug, and the um, sodium gates will start to open until it reaches that threshold, and then it's uphill from there. It's going fast. The sodium is all entering and then it's like, whoa, we're at 30 millivolts. It's pretty positive. So the uh, potassium is going to start to leave through their ion gated channels. And you can see how they're repolarizing, trying to achieve equilibrium again. And there's always going to be an overshoot called hyperpolarization. It gets too negative. It's not, it's past equilibrium again. So they'll use that sodium potassium pump to re get back to that equilibrium and eventually it does. On the right side of the screen, we see an image of really how each segment of the axon goes through that cascade of events. So we use the term cascade. Um, the sodium will come in on that first segment. It gets super positive. It wants to become more negative. So the potassium leaves and then eventually it reaches the resting potential. But now it's time for the next segment to go through that same process. So we just see how it goes through a cascade of events. 
The last step is called response. There's a lot of different responses to a neurological signal, but um, this is just an example of how the neurotransmitters will get released. Again, remember that this is all happening in your brain. After the cascade of channels opening and closing along that axon, the signal finally will reach the axon terminal. Here, the signal will be transmitted to a new cell or to a postsynaptic neuron. So once that action potential reaches the axon terminal, a voltage-gated calcium channel will open. And that gives the signal to those vesicles to say, hey, let's pick up these neurotransmitters and get them out of here. So the vesicle will either dock to the docking protein and then it will go through exocytosis. Exocytosis is when that vesicle fuses to the membrane. Think about like transitioning and fusing into the membrane to release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. And there, the neurotransmitters can bind to the receptors and signal, the signal will be initiated in the postsynaptic cell. Here is a zoomed out version. I know we've been looking super like zoomed in. So here, if you could just take a step back and zoom out, you'll see what is happening at a zoomed out perspective. All right, now we're going to incorporate drugs into our concept of neurons. So we just learned a ton about neurons and now I'm going to teach you more about how a drug works with a neuron. So if you are on opioids, you will take an opioid and it will bind to an opioid receptor on the presynaptic neuron. We all have these receptors in our brains. The opioid will bind and then the cascade of events like the action potential will happen like we talked about. And then all of this activity signals a massive efflux of dopamine into the synaptic cleft, which will release the chemical dopamine, and that is a feel-good chemical, which is why these drugs are so addictive. It makes people feel good, and that's why they become addicted. Another example is nicotine. Nicotine is a stimulant drug, and it mimics the action of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So it will be able to bind to those receptors by basically putting on a costume. You know, if you wanna dress up as a pumpkin and you dress up, you kind of look like a pumpkin. So nicotine kind of tricks those receptors into thinking that it's acetylcholine when it's really not. So it can cause the release of chemicals like dopamine and other things just like an opioid. Um, drugs have not only the ability to bind to those receptors and trick them to release chemicals, they can also do many other things like this slide highlights. Um, they can increase the number of neurotransmitter molecules by destroying degrading enzymes. So there's more neurotransmitters being released so that signal gets passed on more and more. Um, a drug can increase the release of neurotransmitter molecules from the terminal, ac the axon terminals or the drug could even bind to postsynaptic receptors and either activate them or increase the effect on them of neurotransmitter molecules. So again, the signal will be passed on greatly. Um, drugs are very dangerous and neurologically, this is how they work. All right, that is all that I have and I'm going to pass it on to Jarrett to continue to explain um, how these drugs really work. Hello everyone, my name is Jared Geddes and I attend Lance Cruz High School North. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have a huge love for science. I aim to educate others because I love to be educated. Um, so what, what I mean by that is I am very emphatic about science. I have taken, I'm, I've taken AP Biology, AP Chemistry, and I'm currently taking AP Physics. And I have preceded each of those classes with the honors level class of <clears throat> them all. And I have enjoyed, more than enjoyed, each and every one of those classes. I have done the best that I can with those classes to learn as much as I really can and to also educate everyone else around me in those subject areas. Also, I love to talk to my family about the classes that I'm taking. And I, I always express to my dad the new, like, um, 
just new new topics that I learn about in biology, chemistry, or physics. I have always had a love for science, and I really aim to educate you guys about uh, the stuff that we've chosen to talk to you about today. Um, but I'm not just a science fanatic. I also run cross country. I spend a lot of time running, training for my races. I swim also. I spend a lot of time in practice during the winter and I run track also. Same thing as cross country. I work very hard at it. I spend lots of my time working at these sports also in addition to working towards school and getting the best grades that I possibly can. I'm also involved in many clubs in my school such as Link Crew where I introduce the freshmen, the incoming freshmen to the school that they're going to attend for the next four years. I'm a part of SNHS at my, the school that I go, the special school I go to called the Math and Science Center um, that Lena spoke about earlier. And I, in SNHS is the Science National Honor Society. I help tutor kids in science subjects, science subjects such as chemistry, physics, and biology. And I aim to share my love with of science with everyone else in my school. I'm also a part of the National Honor Society at my home school where I help out in the community. So now that you know a little bit about myself, I'm going to take you through my slides. So what is an opioid? Original, originally opioids were divide, derived from plants, the opium poppy. So um, originally we had the opium poppy where opium comes from and it's kind of weird to think of um, opioids as being from a plant because they're not grown. We don't grow opioids. We, we make them. We, ma we manufacture them for medicine and stuff like that, of course, but it's the part of it that is the opium is actually, it actually comes from a plant, which is kind of weird to think about. Um, the original opioid opium is often associated with China. Now, this is because there was something called the Opium War in the 1800s. There were actually two of them, but the first one I know the most about, and the Opium War was a war in which um, Britain had control of India, and there was a large production of opium poppies in India at the time, and Britain, the British people really liked this porcelain that China was making, but China wanted to stop trading the porcelain with them. They didn't want to trade anymore unless Britain was to give them silver. And Britain didn't have much silver. They're like, well, how are we going to get silver? So one of the only ways that they could think of getting silver was by getting the Chinese addicted to this plant opium and getting the silver from the Chinese, which was then used to trade with the Chinese again. So this was a very unfortunate time in history for the Chinese because lots of the Chinese government and higher ups and even the citizens were like hooked onto this opium and just not functioning well. And the, like the whole country was addicted to this opium because they didn't know the side effects of it. And the Chinese ended up getting really angry about it and like, well, this is unfair. This isn't right. And there, there's two wars about it. So that's a that's another that's a huge thing that opioids have had a part in in the, the past. Um, so how do opioids what do opioids do? They interact with opioid receptors. Lena has already explained how this process works. They go into the brain through the bloodstream. They attach onto receptors and they release things chemicals called neurotransmitters into the synapse. So uh, we'll talk about more more about that later. Um, what are the benefits of opioids? People often forget that opioids actually have a lot of benefits. They, opioids, right now we are very concerned about how there's a huge epidemic. There has been an epidemic for the last 10, 15 years of opioid overdoses in the country, and lots of them are young kids, and it, it's painful to watch, but what people don't understand anymore is that opioids are, they're, they're a very powerful painkiller, and they are used for many positive purposes in the world still. They're not just killing people. They're they're helping people every day. So for those with chronic pains, opioids can pro provide significant relief. This is very true for people that have broken a bone, like shattered their bones. They like it's gonna hurt obviously. They they have a broken bone, but the, these opioids can actually help them, can soothe the pain for them, make it make it less of a stressful time on their body, like the from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint. So opioids are very good for that reason. But another thing that they do is they're given to patients for end, 
patients for end of life care, which is a very good thing because people that are at the end of their lives are not having the best time of their life at all by any means. They're, they're in a lot of pain over and over again. And the, the way to just make it the best is just to give them these painkillers, allow them to feel nice and just smooth, like let them feel good before they're passing. So also post-surgery care, same thing like as breaking a bone when you're done with surgery after you break a bone, it's going to hurt for a while when you start to get off of the um, like uh, anesthesia and stuff. And then you get put on opioids and they, they can help you with the pain. The pain level will go down. Um, so we've got types of opioids. Many opioids are illegal street drugs, including opium and heroin. So today we hear a lot in rap songs and such about these illegal drugs. Heroin is actually a synthetic um, form of opioid that has been made for literally for the street use and for drug use to get high. It doesn't have, it's not, it's never been used for a medical purpose in the U.S. at least ever. Um, a number of additional medicines are derived from opium, including morphine and codeine. These are two very popular street drugs right now. We hear a lot about lean, which is a mixture of codeine cough syrup and like soda and that that's in lots of pop culture today and it's not it's awful it's it's just as addictive as the rest of the opioids and it's not good for you it's not it's not used as medicine anymore it's used as just solely the sole purpose to get you high more recently synthetic opioids have become common including heroin oxycodone and fentanyl so down here, I have the chemical structure of each of them. You can see this chemical structure if you ever want to identify it. Um, down here, this is really, really important. It's what it looks like. Oxycodone, we've got hydrocodone, which is the same as Vicodin. We've got codeine, methadone, morphine, heroin in the bag over there because it's often injected straight into the bloodstream rather than intake in through the mouth. And opium that comes from the poppy. Uh, so what are the risks of opioids? Opioids are highly addictive. Many patients receiving prescriptions for Oxycontin or similar drugs become addicted. So opioids are very, very addictive. And they're addictive because when they get into your brain and they attach to those receptors, they release these feel-good chemicals like dopamine. And they're like, oh man, like I, I really want to feel good. I, I, I like this feeling good. I, I, need to, I need to feel good more. And it just causes this cascade of I need it, I need it, I need it. You know what I mean? So Many people receive about this prescription thing. Um, we've actually, Lena has touched on David. Uh, we we had him come in and talk for our Science National Honor Society presentation, and he shared with us his very very intense story of his addiction to heroin and oxycodone. And what he described to us is he was on a baseball scholarship. And he, I don't remember if he broke his arm or his leg or whatever, but he broke something and he needed to go to the hospital to get this prescription. He went to the doctors, he got this prescription for Oxycontin and he was just taking the drugs and he like, he was like, oh, this is good. Cause some people are predisposed to this type of addiction. Lena has talked about predisposition already. Um, but so he was like, man, this feels good. This is good. I really like this. I, I want to, I want more of it. I want more. So he would take them at like in higher amounts at in the same time and he would end up becoming addicted to this oxycontin and he ran out his first prescription and he came back to the doctors he was like oh i need more I, uh, my my arms are really hurting or whatever and they're like well the, like the doctors are saying uh, well it's not time for your prescription to be up yet like you you why is your why are you back already you shouldn't be back yet and he's like oh i just, must have just lost them or whatever so <clears throat> he he gets this new prescription of oxycontin and he finishes it in a week even though it's a month's dose so he by then he's like oh like what do i do now because the doctor's office doesn't let him in they're they're not letting him get this prescription anymore because they know that something's up they know that he's not taking them right but they can't do anything about it so what happens is he turns to the street drugs that we were talking about before heroin fentanyl morphine he turns to those he gets into the drug business and he eventually has a coma almost he overdoses and almost dies from uh, addiction to opioids so it's a very serious thing and yes this is very common patients receiving prescriptions and becoming addicted from it so 
that's something very bad that's happening. And that's part of the reason why we're in such a bad epidemic right now. Um, many of those addicted patients turn to heroin or other street drugs. I already explained that. Um, how do we become addicted? Opioids enter the bloodstream and then flow to the brain. So when we intake opioids either through the mouth or injected straight into the bloodstream, it eventually flows into the brain. It goes throughout the body and then into the brain. And into the brain is where there's a real problem because we know the brain is, it controls our bodies. The brain is one of the most vital organs in our body, if not the most vital. Um, so once reaching the brain, they bind to opioid receptors, reaching, re releasing pleasure-inducing chemicals such as dopamine. So that I've already discussed that, but basically what happens in a nutshell is opioids, the opioids are, they have the correct structure to be able to bind to these receptors that are kind of, they're concave and the opioids are convex and they have the exact right structure to bind into those opioid or those opioid receptors and those opioid receptors what they do is they tell the axon terminals to open up and allow these um these vesicles carrying um uh neurotransmitters such as dopamine and release them into the synapse and what this does is this triggers your midbrain reward system like i have right here and it, t it says oh this feels good i want more of that i want more of that like i've already explained so that that's how it happens at a molecular level um, so that's it for opioids. Now we're at what is alcohol? Alcohol is another very important drug that we often like pass up thinking of drugs because it's not, it's not as severe as the other drugs, but it is very, it causes very big problems and it's huge among the high school level. Um, ingredient and, and alcohol is an ingredient in alcoholic beverages that causes drunkenness. So, I mean, I think we all know that alcoholic beverages are beer, liquor, and wine as we know that. Um, so it occurs when yeast forces sugars through anaerobic respiration. So what anaerobic respiration is, it is, it's essentially a way to get energy. It breaks down sugar to get energy. But what we use, we use the byproducts of this, this process of anaerobic respiration, and we take the alcohol that gets made in the, as a byproduct, and we put it in our drinks, and it is something that binds to our brains the same way that opioids do, and it gets us drunk, and it gets us addicted at the same time. So alcohol is known as a sedative hypnotic drug because when you intake alcohol, you are more susceptible to being sluggish, um, slurred, having slurred words, being clumsy, like just not able to stand up straight. And this, these are the sort of effects that if you were to be hip hypnotized, you would feel these same sort of effects. Um, alcohol is a, dep a depressant, but it begins by acting as a stimulant. Now what this means is that alcohol in alcohol all in all is a depressant because it depresses your ability to do stuff it it makes it slows down everything in your brain which is why eventually if you're a very heavy drinker and you're into a couple of drinks you can eventually fall asleep but it acts as a stimulant at first because it actually like it gets you to talk more which is it, it increases your ability to talk about certain things and to to think about certain things. It increases your ability at first, and it has to do with, at a molecular level, the neurotransmitters that it is releasing, these hormones that are in your body. Uh, alcohol has been around for a very long time. I just thought that I'd say that because unlike the opioids, this is this is not a new problem. This is, Alcoholism is not a new problem. We've had alcohol since, I mean, for goodness sake, it's in the Bible. Jesus Christ um, shares wine with his disciples. He says, take this, all of you, and drink from it. And this, like, he, he, alcohol has been around for so long, so it's not, it's not a new problem. This has been around for a long time. So what happens when one drinks alcohol? Once taken in through the mouth, alcohol moves to the stomach. So that's pretty self-explanatory. It just moves through your esophagus and down into the stomach. Um, 75 to 85% of the alcohol is then taken up through the intestines and into the blood. So once it's in the intestines, that is where it gets into the bloodstream. It flows through the rest of your body, and that's where the real problems begin because we don't want the alcohol in our blood. That's where it's going to carry it everywhere, and carrying it everywhere isn't good because we have these organs in our body that all allow us, they work together to allow us to, to be us, and with all of the organs not working correctly, it just shuts down, which is what can cause us to go into comas eventually when somebody, like, as alcohol poisoning. 
So the blood carries the alcohol to the liver. The liver is a very good place for the alcohol to go because the liver is packed with this stuff called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now that's a big word, but smooth endoplasmic reticulum are basic, they're just a part, it's like a worker inside of a cell that detoxify stuff that's what the job of the smooth er is to detoxify things so what this what this smooth er does is it breaks stuff down into non-harmful chemicals and substances so what it does to alcohol specifically is it breaks it down into compounds that our body is used to such as co2 which gets released through our breath and water which is flowing throughout our body so the liver is a very great place for this alcohol to go but people don't understand that the liver can only break down alcohol at a rate of approximately one drink per hour. So you've really got to limit the drinks that you're taking because the liver is working super hard and it can only do so much. It can only work at this certain speed. It's not going to be able to do anything more than that. Um, lots of people have liver fa failure when they're heavy drinkers. And that's why, because the liver is going to be on overload if you're making it work too hard. So um, up to 10% of the alcohol is able to leave, through the leave the body through urine from the kidneys, and up to 8% of the alcohol can be breathed out. So these are places where the alcohol is able to be excreted from your body. It's also able to get excreted through your sweat, which is another good thing. But alcohol reaches the brain in as little as time, five minutes. So as little time as five minutes. So when alcohol reaches the brain, I, I mentioned when alcohol is in the blood, that's like the first problem. But then once alcohol reaches the brain, that's the, that's the second big problem. Because in the brain, it's able to do so many things to us that we don't even think about sometimes. And that's what I'm going to discuss next. The effects of alcohol on the brain. So once alcohol gets to the brain, it binds to neurotransmitter receptors that affect the amounts of dopamine, glutamate, and GABA in the brain. So what GABA does is GABA... <clears throat> GABA is an inhibitory um, neurotransmitter. And what it does is it inhibits your, inhibits your feeling of being risky. Like it inhibits your, it inhibits your risky feelings. And what, what this does is it, what, what the alcohol does when it gets into your brain is it um, or I'm sorry, it inhibits your cautiousness. So what alcohol does when it gets in the brain is it binds to these receptors that gets GABA to get increased and go into the synapse. And what you have is you have a whole bunch of GABA and it's telling you to, to be cautious. So what's going to happen is you're going to be like, you're going to be going like walking around wobbly and stuff like that. And glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter it's also it's a hormone just like GABA and it is able to get into the synapse and it in it, it like encourage your it, it encourages your um it encourages your riskiness but what what the alcohol does is it binds to these glutamate receptors and then it decreases the amount of glutamate that is secreted th through into the synapse. So you become more, even more slow and just careful of everything you do. And this carefulness, well, well it might sound good to be careful, but it's not good to be this sort of careful because it's this wobbly, like drunkenness sort of feeling. Um, dopamine is um, what, is secreted by opioids also and nicotine you're going to learn about in the next couple slides um that it's a pleasure this is how you get addicted to alcohol because you get this dopamine into the synapse and then your brain's like oh this is good it's the midbrain reward system it's like this is what i need i want more and it wants more so in the cerebral cortex um alcohol inhibits behavioral inhibitory centers like i was explaining with gaba and glutamate um, it slows the processing of information through afferent nerves. So what this means is that when you touch something, see something, smell something, hear something, or taste something, it's going to be very slow to be able to get back to your brain. Afferent nerves run from your senses, your five senses, to the brain. So this means that your reactions are much, much lower. So if you see like a cat run across your path, your brain's going to take a much longer time to process it than if it would when you were sober. And so this is why driving is so terrible when you're drunk, because the afferent nerves are just not working the way that they're meant to. They're, they're slowed down. Your nerves are much more slowed down than they normally are. And it also inhibits thought processes, which is another reason why driving is not a good idea when you're under the influence. Um, so in the cerebellum, 
it affects movement and balance, which is part of this thing. This must have much have to be, must have to do with GABA and the glutamate. You're being very like weird, like you're not walking straight. You can't. You're way less coordinated than normal. And the medulla. So this is the biggest problem. When it gets into the medulla, it affects natural body functions such as breathing and sweating and um, blinking. Like they're just they're all affected and they're all out of whack. And this is what causes you to sometimes just be like fall asleep when you're drunk or under the influence. It's just, it just, everything shuts down eventually, which can lead to alcohol poisoning. So what is tobacco and nicotine? Tobacco and nicotine are the main, or the main source of nicotine for high schoolers comes from e-cigarette devices. Now what we call them is vapes. Um, an e-cigarette consists of a cartridge holding a liquid solution of nicotine, chemicals, and flavorings, and a heating device, power source, and mouthpiece. So <clears throat> these at the bottom are all different um, versions of e-cigarettes or vapes as we call them. And <clears throat> this is something that's very popular at the high school level, and it, it is not good at all. It damages your brain in some of the sort, same ways that opioids do. So let's learn about it. So these are all of the... Um, these are some of the chemicals that are inside of the inhale, the juice that you inhale when you vape. So we've got nicotine over here. We know that that's an addictive substance. We've got the ultrafine particles over here. These can probably have a problem because they're foreign. We've got volatile organic compounds. We've got cancer causing chemicals. We've got heavy metals. Like why do we don't want stuff like this inside of our body? Why do we want heavy metals in our body? And we've got fla or, um, flavors that are associated with lung disease. So all of this stuff is going into your body when you get um, when you inhale smoke or juice from vapes. So nicotine addiction. When using an e-cigarette, nicotine enters the bloodstream from the lungs, then travels back to the brain within seconds. So this is a problem because we first of all we don't want the nicotine in our lungs in the first place. The lungs are just like the brain. They're the brain, the lungs, and the heart are three of the most vital organs in the body. We don't want anything messing with our lungs. We don't want anything messing with our heart. So we don't want this stuff to get into our lungs, but then it is in our lungs, and then that's where it enters the bloodstream, and it's it gets into the brain, and then it messes with our brain the same way that alcohol and opioids do. They're all linked together, and they're all terrible for you because of the way that they can mess up the neuron pathways inside your head. Nicotine, like other drugs, binds to neuron receptors in the brain, like I just explained, causing the release of feel-good chemicals like dopamine. See, it's all linked. All of these things release dopamine, and we don't want this dopamine release. We want the natural release of dopamine. We don't want, we don't want to like have a fluctuation in our dopamine release because it, it could just mess up everything in our brain the way that we've explained. This high is what makes nicotine so addictive, especially for impressionable teenagers. So yes. Teenagers are very susceptible to be drawn into these um, e-cigarettes these e we call vapes, and part of it is due to advertisement, and we, we've got to get this to stop because it's not okay for teens to be inhaling this stuff that has, like we, we've seen, metals and just these tiny particles that are foreign to the body. We have um, stuff that causes cancer. It's not okay. None of this is okay, and I hope that you guys have learned a lot from this presentation. I'm going to pass it off to Hunter now. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hi. I am Hunter. I'm a big fan of science and I am so grateful for the opportunity to present to you. I believe that addiction is one of the biggest issues of our time. And the more that we know about the science involved, the better we can handle it. If you have any questions after, feel free to email me at that email down there. Now, first we're going to talk about the dopamine reward circuit. Now, dopamine is released to reward the brain. It's released when the brain does something that it thinks it wants to do again. So if you eat a cake or do something that you want to do, it's essentially positive conditioning for the brain. And you can see it here. We've got a carbon ring with a few double bonds. We've got an amine. That's why it's called dopamine. Now, the dopamine reward circuit is going to begin down here in the ventral tegmental, tegmental area. Now, down here, a neuron is going to release dopamine and it's going to travel all along this axon to the nucleus accumbens, as well as the prefrontal cortex. It's going to make the brain feel good. Now, what is going to make an opioid overdose lethal? Because that dopamine isn't going to be lethal, even in large amounts. 
right? Opioids, they bond to that ventral tegmental area and will cause the brain to release more dopamine down that axon to the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. But opioids also bond to the pre botzinger complex, right? And it's because opioids naturally in our body, the ones we produce are intended to help regulate pain pathways as well as regulate unconscious breathing. And because of that, when opioids bind normally to this pre botzinger complex, it's gonna slow down your breathing. So the problem here is that when you're overdosed on opioids, when you have so much opioids in your system, they're all binding to this, those receptors in the pre botzinger complex. And that's telling your lungs to slow down. We don't need to breathe so fast. So eventually your lungs are gonna stop. You're not gonna breathe at all. And that is what kills people when they have too many opioids. So we don't want people to die. So scientists have created this wonder drug called Narcan. Now Narcan is gonna reverse the effects of an overdose because what happens is instead of allowing those opioids to bind to those receptors in the brain and on the pre botzinger complex, Narcan is gonna come in there and block them. It fits in well enough to those receptors that opioids are not gonna be able to attach properly. So instead of opioids activating the receptors, the receptors are gonna be blocked by Narcan. So within a few minutes, two to eight minutes, breathing is gonna be able to return to normal and death is gonna be prevented, which is awesome. So next we're gonna talk about hedonic homeostasis. So what is hedonic homeostasis? Well, you can think of it sort of like your baseline happiness level. On any given day, people generally trend toward a baseline happiness level in the long run. Not everyone's the same. Yours can be a little bit higher and lower. And obviously, every day is going to be different, ups and downs. But your baseline happiness is generally the hedonic homeostasis level that you generally are at. So what are the main emotional states surrounding drug use? Well, these, this cycle is generally divided into preoccupation and anticipation, which is, you know, getting ready, thinking about the drug before taking it, binge and intoxication, actually taking the drug, as well as withdrawal and negative effects. So this is after you have the drug and maybe you're not feeling as good because you don't have the drug anymore. Now, in the early stages of addiction, it's dominated by impulsivity because you, you're feeling like you want to have that drug. It's an impulsive mechanism, right? But in the later stages, it switches more to a impulsivity. Now, as an individual moves from this impulsive state, the compulsive state, what is driving it becomes less about positive reinforcement and taking it to feel good and more about negative reinforcement. Right, so negative reinforcement is the removal of a bad stimulus, something you don't want to happen in a situation, the bad emotional state caused by drug withdrawal that is going to increase the probability of a certain response. So in this, that sad state by not having drugs is going to drive you to take drugs. And this kind of is through stages that interact with each other and over time, so we can be addicted because as you see this positive reinforcement goes down, negative reinforcement goes up, and you still want to just have more and more of the drug. Now, it's postulated that once these heavy emotional states are initiated, they're automatically going to be regulated by the central nervous system with mechanisms that reduce the intensity of these endonic feelings. So as you can see in this graph, we've got people who've been smoking cocaine and they've got pretty high blood concentration around 450. And their emotional state goes up pretty high. You can see it up here, this is neutral, so up here is super positive. But over time, we see it quickly drop off a lot faster than we see the cocaine drop off. So as we can see, the cocaine is not directly, cocaine concentration is not directly correlated with this emotional state because already, well, there's still a lot of cocaine in the blood. The emotional state is already reported as overall negative. Are you feeling bad despite the fact that there's still a lot of cocaine in their blood? And they start to return to normal as the cocaine levels out. But 
if the cocaine is still in there, how, how are they feeling bad? Well, it's because the body is trying to regulate that. It's trying to stop those intense feelings. Now, drugs of abuse kind of dysregulate this reward system because the body starts recruiting these anti-reward circuits to prevent it. You can see it again in this graph, these graphs, because as we go up with more and more cocaine injections, the baseline threshold for a reward response to be activated is going up and up. Down here, after two hours, we're a little bit higher, 20. A little bit higher than that, 40. Even higher than that, just a little bit. And then at 80, well, look at how high we are. Look at how much it'll take to go through a reward. Reward response, reward response at 80 cocaine injections. It's ridiculously high. Now, there's been a lot of imaging studies in drug addicted humans to look at their brains. And what we found across the board is that in people who have had chronic cocaine use, is the, the amount of D2 dopamine receptors, which are those receptors in your brain that are gonna realize that the dopamine's there, that the dopamine and result in that pleasurable response is going down. There's less dopamine receptors in the brain. Why does this happen? Well, the body's probably trying to decrease the amount of dopamine receptors to try and get back to that hedonic set point because these emotional levels are so high, it's trying to regulate them back down to a normal, acceptable level. So there's this idea called the allostatic hypothesis, which is allostasis is essentially stability through change. So we've got this chronic deviation from the norm, right? So because the body is desperately trying to return to this normal state when we're on these drugs, it's been recruiting these anti-reward systems as well as decreasing the activity of the reward system. So we saw that with the decrease in the D2 receptors. So the, you see, like we've got our hedonic set point, but over time in this person, you can see it trending down. It's being allostatically changed. And this is thought to be a driving factor in why even in protracted absence, there's a motivational background for craving and relapse. So, Next, because drugs, the intensity of the drug and the chemical responses it has for everyone isn't always the only factor. I'm talking about some other stuff. So I'm talking about diamorphine. And diamorphine is a drug that they use in medicine in the United Kingdom. It's outlawed in the United States, but they use it in the United Kingdom. And every year it's used on hundreds of people, right? And diamorphine is essentially heroin. In fact, it's a lot stronger than your average street heroin. Because street heroin is going to be diluted down by dealers, middlemen to try and increase the profits. But diamorphine is pretty pure, hard stuff. But the thing is, most of the time when people are given diamorphine in hospitals, they have placements of cancer, just extreme pain, they don't become addicted, despite the fact that there are chemical changes going on. Now, there's been a lot of rat models on addiction. Some of the early ones, we had rats. We put them into solitary cages with two different waters. We had a drugged water with maybe heroin or cocaine and some or something, and a normal water, which is just your standard water. Now the rats almost always tried the drug water and became addicted to it over time. They had more of it. Before long, they were compulsively using that drug water, and we saw them exhibit the kind of physical withdrawal effects and eventually they'd have so much that they overdosed and died. Just not, not great for the rats. One scientist saw this and decided he wanted to try something else. He put a bunch of rats in a ideal rat habitat. The rats could run around, they could frolic with the other rats, run through tubes, play around, and they could make little rats. Now in the experiment he again went with the two different waters, a drugged water and a normal water. And he found that in Rat Park, the amount of rats that were becoming addicted to that drugged water was significantly less than in the experiment of the rats in the solitary cages. Why do you think that happens? So 
Something very similar happened with humans during the Vietnam War. Now, in the Vietnam War, 20% of US troops were using a significant amount of heroin. And a lot of people worried that these people were gonna come back, be drug addicts, and we'd have to deal with all these veteran drug addicts after the Vietnam War. But the thing is, studies followed these men back, and they found that they found that these men weren't becoming drug addicts. They were able to stop after they returned home. They didn't have to go to rehab, and they didn't even really report any withdrawal symptoms. Once these men returned to their homes with their happy families, they stopped. They were taken out of that terrible environment and put into a better one. And they were happy, and they were able to quit pretty easily. So, it seems to indicate that with, when you're happy with healthy bonds, recovery is a lot easier. So, a lot of people have pointed out with the failures of the war on drugs, because unfortunately, a lot of times, instead of helping people heal and get their lives back together, we cast them out from society. We make it harder for them to get jobs and become stable. We throw them in cages. We put people who are not well and in a situation that makes them feel worse. And it makes recovery difficult. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoy our presentation. I'm sorry if we dragged on or lost your interest. Thank you so much.